find internal loads at C. Now we're given a coordinate system here, so I'll just uh, stay with that one, or at least stay with that orientation so it looks the same as my picture. I have two external forces, F1 and F2. I have a built-in connection at the wall, uh, at the origin, uh, and we're told what those uh, forces are. The steps are the same as what we saw in 2D, uh, typically. Now we see here that we have that we have one reaction or one connection to that wall, so we could find what those uh, what was happening at the wall, the couples at the wall, and the forces at the wall, since it's not able to it's a built-in connection there. But actually, in this case, because of just the geometry of the problem, we can actually solve this without first solving those external forces at the wall. We are able to jump right into internal forces. So this is the uh, the type of problem like we saw in trusses where Usually we started with finding all of those external reactions and then went to our internal cuts for the truss or our pins for the truss. This is the same type of idea is that we can get away without doing an external picture and jump right to our internal picture because like in 2D, I have the option when I make a cut through my surface to take everything on one side of the cut or everything on the other side of the cut. So in this case when I cut at C, if I take everything, I'll say to the left of it, that will encompass what's happening at that wall at the origin, which I don't know what those reactions are. Or if I take everything to the other side, then I'm encompassing the rest of this pipe. It has a free end over here. So if I take the other side, I actually don't have any external reactions there. So the only unknowns I'm going to have are those new ones I introduce at C. So kind of a, a shortcut to this problem is making the cut at C and take everything to the right of that cut and I don't need an, in, an external free body diagram in that case. I'm going to put my, the center of my coordinate system there, but I'm going to stick with that same uh, 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 relation here. So Y is coming out this way. I'll have it Z is up, and I'll have X is down to the left. From C to this elbow is going to be two feet, and from the elbow to this end is going to be three feet, or I could use uh, coordinates here. Now in this case, I did move my coordinate system to where the cut was, uh, so I would just have to be careful that all my coordinates are based on the same origin. I have those two external forces, F2, which I'm told its value is 150i minus 300k pounds. And F1, 350j minus 400k pounds. And I'm ignoring the weight of the pipe itself. So externally, that's what's affecting my, uh, the pipe every, uh, to the right of it. Again, because I took everything to the right, I don't see what's happening at the wall at the origin. So I don't have those external unknowns, those external reactions in this picture. But where I split it apart at point C, I do have to model what were those internal loads that were keeping the pipe together and from flying apart internally at point C. Start with uh, putting the internal normal force since that's going to be determined by the outward normal from the surface of the cut. So by keeping this side of the pipe, the outward normal force is going to be pointing this way, which I'll call P, and it will be based on my coordinate system in the negative Y direction. But again, this is, I determine this direction because that's the outward normal to the surface of my cut. And it goes along the negative y-axis in this case. Parallel to the surface of the cut are, is the xz plane. So I can split my shear force into the two components that are parallel to that surface. So in this case, I'll have a component along the z, I'll assume is positive, called v sub z, and a component along the x, I'll call vx. Again, in reality, there's really only one shear force. There's only one force that's going to be parallel to that plane of the cut. But for convenience, I can split it up into an X component and a Z component of that single force. So I have the three forces internally that are going to be happening there. Now I need the three couples that are going to occur. I'll start with the internal torsion. Again, its direction is going to be based on the direction of P. So if I put my thumb along the direction of P with my right hand, 
then the way that my fingers go is going to be how I assume the direction of T is. So I'm assuming that internal torsion is positive around that P axis, which is parallel to the negative Y axis, or in the same direction as the negative Y axis. And that'll be important when I get to my equilibrium equations, because when that is based on X, Y, and Z coordinates, so I have to then look at my coordinate system in order to know will that torsion be positive or negative around X, Y, Z. And I have two components of moment that are going to be along X and Z. And I'll assume they're positive around both of those axes. So I'll have, I'll call MX and MZ. <whistles> Counting it up, we have six unknowns now, which from chapter five, we know how to handle. And we're going to treat it by finding these equilibrium equations like we did for chapter five. But now we have internal loads rather than external or reaction loads. So the process is going to be the same. We can start with our force equations to get our P, our Vx, our Vz. And I'll present them as scalars here. So along the x direction, I'm assuming my Vx value is positive. So in my equation, it'll be positive Vx. I have 150 from F2. And F1 does not have an I component. So the only unknown I have in my equation number one is Vx, which I can solve that Vx is negative 150 pounds. In the y direction, according to my coordinate system, I have P in the negative y direction. So in my equation, it will be a negative P. I have 350 J from F1, or 350 along the y-axis. And F2 does not have a J term, so then this is my complete equation 2, which means I can solve for my only unknown, which is going to be P, is 350 pounds. Like in 2D, this internal normal force, I get the interpretation of positive or negative as long as I draw it outward uh, from the surface. That positive will mean that it's in tension, at that point, and negative will mean it's in compression. And finally, in the z direction, I have vz, I'm assuming, is positive. Minus 300 from F2, minus 400 from F1. So solving equation number three, I get vz is 700 pounds. Generally, these force equations, like we saw in unit number two, are uh, easy to construct because we're just adding I terms or J terms or K terms together. And actually, once you get to this step for the internal forces, because it always looks like a built-in connection, there'll only be one unknown in each of these equations. Now, in general, though, if we did have to first start with the external reactions and solve those, we have to do those six equations first. Then we come and we can draw these six equations. We were able to short circuit that a little bit because we could make a cut and take a side of it that did not include any of our external forces in this example. We have the three forces, now we need the three couples, or the two bending moments and the internal torsion. As we saw in chapter five, I can take the sum of moments as a vector around some point so in this case, just like we saw when we had built-in connections uh, for the rigid body equilibrium, I prob probably want to see here to take the moment about. And again, this is a vector equation. Everything's going to have i, j, or k components attached to it. And then we'll also be using cross products like we did in chapter number five. And this is also will serve as a good review for the final exam since it is comprehensive. So what causes a moment around point C? Well, couples cause moments, and forces that act somewhere other than point C will potentially cause moments as well. From our free body diagram, we have three couples here, the in two internal bending moments and the torsion. We have MX around the I direction. 
we have t, which is along the negative y direction, or around the negative y direction, so negative tj. And I have mz, which is acting around the k direction, or around the z-axis. Again, I'm assuming mx was positive and mz was positive, just because uh, it's easier to have them assume they're going with my coordinate system. But t I selected because that was the positive direction around the p-axis. Those are the couples with i's, j's, and k's. Remember, this is a vector equation. You need those uh, unit vectors attached to them. And then also we're going to have moments caused around c by f1 and by f2. So I'll jump right to uh, drawing it, writing it as a determinant here. All the way back to unit number two, how do we take, let's look at the moments caused by F2. So what do I fill in in my determinant here for the moment around C caused by F2? Uh, right, zero to zero. So remember where this is coming from is we're using R cross F to calculate the moment. It's not F cross R, it's R cross F. So the second row is going to be R, and R is going to point from the point I want the moment about to the point where that force is being applied. I'll call this point A just for convenience here. Okay. So it's going from C to A. So we want to take the, if we had a coordinate system down here, we would take A, the coordinates of A minus the coordinates of C would give us RCA. So in this case, A would be located at 0 to 0, and point C, I'm sorry, uh, 0, 3.50, 0. and point C, at least according to that coordinate system, would be located at 0, 1.50, so to go from C to A, we have to go 2 in the J direction. Right, so uh, again, coordinates of A minus the coordinates of C, I get 0, 2, 0. And then the third row, I put in the components of the force. So in that case, I already have it, I was given it in, co in a component form. So that will be 150, 0 in the J, negative 300 in the K. And that's in feet. We want to pay attention to our units here. Uh, F2 and F1 are in pounds. All of our distances are in feet. So if I write it all like this, my MX, T, and MZ, I will get in foot pounds or pound feet is my answer. Right, then I want the moments caused by F1. So to go from C to where F1 is being applied, I'll just call it B for the moment, I'll use RCB cross F2. Uh, sorry, that's F1. So I go from C to what I'm calling B, I have to go 2 in the Y. And I have to go positive 3 in the I direction and 0 in the K. And then the components of F1 I was given were 0, 350, and negative 400. When I expand these, I'll have IJK components. I'll have IJK components. I already attach the I, the J, and the K to the couples here. So I can expand this out and group the like terms together. I won't go through all those details. We'll go over those again during our review. Um, but if I expand those out, I get negative 1,400 plus mx have i terms. 1,200 minus t are my j terms. And 750 plus mz make up my k terms. Individually, the, each coefficient has to be equal to zero since my left-hand side is zero i plus zero j plus zero k. So this vector equation with i's, j's, and k's, I, get, I can get three scalar equations out by setting each of these coefficients individually equal to zero. So my equation four, I'm going to get that zero equals negative 1400 plus mx. Therefore, mx must be 1400 pound feet.
setting 0 equals 1,200 minus t. t must be 1,200 pound-feet. And finally, 0 equals 750 plus mz. So mz must equal negative 750 pound-feet. <laughs>